down here, salt is a way of life. Obviously, the environment down here is all salt. The, the ceiling's salt, the floor is salt, the walls are salt, and to an extent, the air is salt. And you breathe that in, and you can constantly taste the salt. So, Fire and Leaf Green were probably the first Pokemon games I ever disliked. And it's funny, because I thought when I went to replay them that I would end up turning around on them in the context of what Pokemon games, and especially Pokemon remakes, are like now. After all, compared to, say, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, they seem to have at least put effort into giving returning players more of a reason to play them beyond just updating a game that they've already completed. Right? They're polished, they have some improvements mechanically over the games that preceded them, and they introduce new content to help justify their existence with a pretty lengthy post-game adventure. Well, it's funny, because while yes, these things are all true, they're in the Fantastic Gen 3 engine and they do have more content than the original Red, Blue, and Yellow games, it's impossible to divorce them from the context that they were released in, and how they fit into and really drag down Generation 3 overall. And although I did find more to like about them revisiting them than I expected, the same flaws kept jumping out at me and are impossible to ignore. The biggest problem is that Fire and Lamp Green were the first Pokemon games that were pretty clearly not designed as a labor of passion by the developers, who had some story they really wanted to tell or some mechanic set that they really wanted to explore, but rather a corporate decision. Fire and Lake Green are business moves first and games second, and that permeates every aspect of their design. You might be thinking, that's kind of harsh. I mean, don't all Pokemon games exist to turn a profit? And sure, Pokemon as a franchise has been wildly profitable from the very beginning, and I'm sure it wasn't developed solely as an artistic labor with no thoughts of commercial viability. But until this point, Red and Blue were the games that Game Freak as indie developers worked for years to gain enough faith from their investors and peers in the industry and technical skill to make. Gold and Silver were their first chance with full access to resources under Nintendo to make the game of their dreams that they'd always wanted to make. Ruby and Sapphire were their first chance to talk to a global audience about something really important to them. The games in the series until this point used the opportunity to make a commercial product as a way to make art the developers were passionate about and the profit at the same time. The commercial viability gave them a platform to influence a generation of kids, and they were aware of it and had something they wanted to say through their games. But Fire Red and Lake Green came down the pipe in a completely different way, and although their intentions may not have been cynical from the start, the outcome is pretty disappointing. Wow, that's a pretty tantalizing intro, huh? Bet you can't wait to get into today's topic and find out all of my spicy, salty takes. Well, we will absolutely get into it, but first give me just 10 seconds to tell you about today's featured Black-owned business, The New Black Clothing Company. This is an online thrift store where you can pick out previously owned but still in great condition clothing for very affordable prices. Why shop used? Because every day tons and tons of clothing gets dumped out in landfills everywhere. Reusing clothes that have plenty of life left in them is a great way to cut down on waste and save money. The New Black Clothing Company features styles for both men and women in all kinds of sizes, so feel free to check them out using the link below. Once again, this video is not sponsored, I'm not getting paid to talk about them, but they did allow me to use their service for free to try it out to promote to you. They were also kind enough to offer you all a discount code, which will save you money at checkout. Use TOMA10 for 10% off your whole order. This is not an affiliate code, by the way. I don't make a cut from the sales. This is just for their purposes. So if you'd like to get some new clothes and save the planet at the same time, please check them out. And now back to the regularly scheduled hot takes. Part 1. Why are fire red, leaf green? Gather round, friends! It's time for everyone's favorite part of the video! Story time! The story of Fire Red and Leaf Green begins with two men, Tsunekazu Ishihara, president of the Pokemon Company International, and Satoru Iwata, the president of Nintendo from 2002 to 2015. The two are both alumni of the development staff on EarthBound, with Ishihara coming from Ape Incorporated and Iwata from HAL Laboratory, the two co-developers of the game. EarthBound as a franchise has a rough history, with their one game that made it overseas in the US failing commercially, and a planned sequel entering development hell. While this was going on, CEO of Ape Shigesato Itoi stepped down from his role and the company was restructured into Creatures Inc. in 1995. Iwata assisted in the founding of the new company and Ishihara would become the new CEO. From very early on, Iwata and Ishihara would have a very close working relationship. Nintendo would ask Creatures to assist the fledgling game development company Game Freak in making their first massive RPG. Since Game Freak were still rookies and desperately needed technical assistance, and the enduring partnership of Creatures, Game Freak, and Nintendo was born, although not not quite in the way we know it today. Despite not necessarily believing in Pokemon's potential to succeed as much as the higher-ups at Nintendo did, having been 
recently burned by the failure of Earthbound in the West, Ishihara kind of reluctantly fell into the role of managing the franchise. The graph paper loving doofuses at Game Freak were there to make games, not manage the business dealings. The duty of deciding which toys got made and handling the communication with various projects around the Pokemon brand fell mostly to creatures, with Ishihara being at the center of a lot of big decisions. He quickly became the most knowledgeable person to talk to about products related to Pokemon. And of course, he got his BFF Iwata in on it too. Bro! Iwata and his company, Howe, were called upon to develop Pokemon Stadium, and pretty quickly through this process, Iwata became chummy with everyone at Game Freak as well. During Pokemania, the business dealings seemed chaotic to say the least. The head of marketing at Nintendo at the time, Takashi Kawaguchi, became a middleman between Game Freak and the rest of the world. A lot of the licensing deals came through people contacting Nintendo and then being routed to Ishihara and Creatures. Riding the tidal wave of success, the process was a lot less formal and a lot less conservative than it is today, and Game Freak kind of had to just trust their partners to make good decisions on what projects to greenlight. Some of these decisions definitely paid off, but a lot of them were also kind of slapdash, like Nintendo tying the suddenly hot Pokemon IP to other unrelated titles they were already developing, like Jack and the Beanstalk suddenly becoming Pokemon Snap. From very early on, Nintendo was leaning on Pokemon to help market their peripherals and technologies. Several 64DD Pokemon titles were announced and then subsequently moved to normal Nintendo 64 carts once the add-on failed, and several of the spin-off games at the time capitalized on pricey peripherals, like Hey You Pikachu's VRU and Pokemon Stadium's Transfer Pack. It was around this point that it became all too obvious that there needed to be some lines drawn and rules put into place about who was and wasn't responsible for Pokemon. There was a need for the decisions about which Pokemon products would get made to be in the hands of people actually involved in the production of Pokemon games, and the business dealings had become too complicated with three companies so heavily involved in the franchise. So in 2001, Iwata and Ishihara worked together on creating the Pokemon Company. Iwata had moved over to Nintendo, and given his familiarity with everything Pokemon, was given the task to organize the rights to Pokemon under one umbrella. The Pokemon Company would serve as a formal entity to interact with other companies looking to work with the brand. They needed a Lorax for Pikachu. Ishihara was made the Pokemon Company's first president, and Game Freak, Creatures, and Nintendo each owned near equal shares of Pokemon. Everything was settled! Just in time for the wave that they were riding to crest and start declining. Pokemania was ending. So suddenly, the man who never thought it would last was now in charge of making it last forever, somehow. And really, what is their plan if Pokemon ever fails? They don't have a fallback IP. What are they gonna do? Push hard on Pocket Card Jockey? Who the f cares about Pocket Card Jockey? So when Fire and Lake Green roll around, they know one thing. They need to survive because the wave had broken and they were headed for a plunge. In order to accomplish this, Pokemon would need to adapt to stay within their demographic. Pokemon wasn't going to chase kids into their teens and adulthood. Survival and sustainability require expanding to new players because you don't know what tomorrow brings. So why exactly did they remake the games that made them famous? It was a business decision. They needed something easy and safe to go back to that could be aimed at newcomers to Pokemon. For better or worse, this seems to always be in their pocket when they need to try to grab younger demographics, as ever since doing this they've always gone back to Kanto for this reason. They also needed to fill the holes in the Pokedex left by moving up to the Game Boy Advance, and conveniently most of the missing Pokemon were Kanto natives. And remember how Nintendo would like to use Pokemon to push new technology they were developing? Yeah, that didn't suddenly stop when a formal partnership was established. And since since Ishihara and Iwata were still BFFs, and Iwata had just become president of Nintendo, there really wasn't any pushback when these decisions started coming back down the pipe. So when Nintendo comes skipping down the street with mobile adapter and bouquet of roses in hand for Ishihara, looky what got pushed in Pokemon Crystal. And again, a few years later when Iwata came back with a shiny new communication technology they were developing, the prototype wireless adapter for the Game Boy Advance, Ishihara welcomed him with open arms. Now, even despite the idea to push the mobile adapter in Fire and Leaf Green coming from Nintendo, it's not like they were being forced to do it. In fact, all parties had something to gain. Ishihara believed it was a perfect fit for Pokemon considering the franchise was already based on requiring games to connect to one another in order to necessitate multiple versions, and with the adapter not being compatible with the games that they had already sold, to use it, more players would buy more copies of the new games. Game Freak got to take a break after the crunch hell that was developing Ruby and Sapphire and relax with a lighter development load, and Nintendo got something even more valuable, development experience with wireless communication that would later be used 
with working on the DS. Attaching a big IP to the adapter meant that they could mass produce it, and maybe even break even on research and development costs. And if they were really lucky, they could depend on it creating a big install base that other games could capitalize on. It was a win-win-win for everyone. This also really illustrates how these early professional relationships had come to bear fruit in the new era. The three owners of the Pokemon company all liked each other. Iwata was now president of Nintendo, and he wasn't really interested in micromanaging or bullying Game Freak into doing what they wanted. Game Freak, Ishihara, and Nintendo just found ways to come to agreements on what to do. And that's how we got Fire Red and Leaf Green. It checked all the boxes. Easy, safe, and a convenient vehicle for making good on an investment of time and resources and technology that would be crucial for the upcoming era. And this really set the stage for how maintaining that good relationship would be beneficial going forward. It's not a mistake that the current president of Nintendo in Japan served on the board of directors for the Pokemon Company. Fire and Link Green were the first moves in making sure Pokemon was sustainable, and if they could make Nintendo happy in the process, it was simply killing two birds with one stone. It's a shame that the only the only people who were losers in this arrangement were the series' longtime fans. Part 2. Did you hear they're remaking Dumb and Dumber? So, we understand the decision to remake these games from a business perspective, but let's talk about the concept of Pokemon remakes for a second from a consumer standpoint. Remakes in general tend to come across as sort of a lazy move, because rather than developing something new or taking a risk on a new idea, they comfortably cash in on something safe and familiar that people already know they like, and require a lot less effort from developers to recreate. So for me already, they're kind of a hard sell. They have to work a lot harder to justify making me have the same experience again by innovating it in some way. Especially since in this case, the hardware that these games were released on were backwards compatible with the original Red and Blue for the Game Boy, which had only been out for five years in the US at the time of Fire Red and Leaf Green's release. But rather than just porting the old experiences to newer hardware, Pokemon remakes have always worked to incorporate modern gameplay innovations into the games, rather than maintaining the experience of the originals exactly. These games are not carbon copies of the originals, and do modernize the gameplay by carrying over innovations like held items, abilities, the new typings, natures, and everything else that you can find in their closest peers, Ruby and Sapphire. And Fire Red and Leaf Green do feature new content compared to what you'd find in Red and Blue. There are new features like the Versus Seeker, the Fame Checker, the Wireless Room and Minigames, and an entire extra post-game area made up of seven distinct islands, each with completely new content. For the very first remakes of Pokemon games ever, they set a precedent that Pokemon remakes would always follow, which is that they do indeed put in a little extra work to make sure that there is a difference between playing the original and the new version. So Fire Red and Leaf Green were never going to be truly faithful to the original games that they were remaking, and frankly that's a good thing. But they seem confused about the lengths to which they'll go to try to offer a familiar safe experience to players, conflicted about how much they're willing to let players deviate from the original vision of what a Kanto journey was like in 1998. A majority of the innovations introduced in these games were accessible only in late or post-game, meaning that much of the content of the game for the majority of your playtime was pretty identical to the original games, just with some more modern mechanics slapped on top. They did put in effort to make it a unique experience from the original games, but it only really becomes that once you've already put in a significant amount of playtime playing the game exactly like the original. Hell, one example that's pretty emblematic of this problem on a smaller scale is the fact that you don't even get the running shoes at all until after you've traveled all the way to Pewter City and earned your first badge. So much of Kanto, the Pokemon you have to work with, and the progression and the experience of the games is left very similar to the original games, in a period of time where we had actually only spent three years away from Kanto at all. The ways in which the mechanics do change the experience also feel sort of accidental rather than deliberate, but we'll get into that more later. Despite the fact that on paper, these games might meet my expectations of what a remake should do to justify its existence, in practice it doesn't really do that at all, and this is where it starts to lose me. Ultimately, what doesn't work about Fire and Leaf Green boils down to one major design decision that is the culmination of this problem. The one major flaw that completely ruins the games for me. And this is the limits that they placed on which Pokemon are available for the majority of the game. Not just through limiting which Pokemon appear in the wild, but also by placing very strict control over which Pokemon the player is allowed to receive in trades from other games in the series. 
series, ensuring that through the majority of the game, the player can only use the original 150 Pokemon that were found in red and blue. Let me explain. Until you beat the Elite Four and catch at least 60 Pokemon native to Kanto, you cannot receive a single non-native Pokemon in a trade with any game. Until you complete the entire post game and explore all of the Sevi Islands, you cannot trade with Ruby and Sapphire at all. This means that for the majority of the game, you can only guarantee a trade with other copies of Fire Red and Leaf Green that have also not completed the game. Because once you complete the game, you gain access to breeding in the Sevi Islands with non-Kanto native Pokemon, which can't be traded to non-completed copies. And since a lot of Kanto Pokemon gain non-native evolutions or baby forms later, that also locks out a lot of what you caught during the story. And this includes friendship evolutions like Blissey and Crobat. To add insult to injury, you have to sit through their trying and failing to evolve animation every time they level up anyway before you beat the game, unless you give them an Everstone. So to put it plainly, until you have basically already done all that there is to do in the game, you cannot under any circumstances receive or catch any Pokemon that isn't native to Kanto, making this the absolute strictest they have ever been in the entire series about what Pokemon are available to the player and when. None of the other remakes have ever pulled this crap again. Now, why is this such a big problem? If you are one of the new players that the game was designed to attract to replace the previous audience, you might not even notice or care that the Pokemon that you have to work with are so limited. After all, not everyone who plays Pokemon even trades to begin with. And back then, having people to trade with at all wasn't a given, considering you had to be in the same physical space as another person who owned the game to do it. Well, let's review the original reason that they made this game, and why anyone would have wanted it when it came out, shall we? Reasons for Game Freak to make Fire Red and Leak Green Number 1. To fix the national decks and fill back in the missing Pokemon that weren't found in Ruby and Sapphire. Number 2. To test the wireless adapter, recoup R&D costs for Nintendo, and lay the groundwork for the DS era. Number 3. It's a safe and easy bankable adventure that people already know they like in an uncertain moment for the franchise that is re-geared to be accessible for new players. And reasons for anyone to buy Fire Red and Leaf Green. Number 1. You get the Kanto and Johto Pokemon that weren't in Gen 3 until this point. Number 2. If you're a more casual player who hasn't replayed Kanto games a bunch up until this point, you might be nostalgic for Kanto. But it's very hard to miss something that won't go away and was still very accessible at the time that these games were made. Number 3. You've never played a Pokemon game before. Since I don't fall into either of the latter two categories, the only reason I would have wanted this thing was reason one. Now granted, if either of the other two reasons did apply to you, it's totally understandable why you might not share my frustration with these games. Not everyone plays Pokemon games the same way, and not everyone shares the same expectations for the games as I obviously did. But as a person in the camp of only wanting these games for one reason, they really missed the mark for me. If you wanted to be uncharitable, holding half the decks hostage by excluding it from Ruby and Sapphire to begin with could be viewed as anti-consumer, much in the same way people rail against Game Freak excluding Pokemon from the recent Sword and Shield games. Not that I necessarily agree, but you could make that argument. However, holding it hostage within its own game when it was finally introduced back into the canon definitely felt anti-consumer. Not only were they making sure we replayed a game nearly completely unchanged from the original not very many years after our first time playing it, they went out of their way to be so insanely strict about it that you can't even trade into or out of Fire and Leaf Green until after you 100% complete all of the post-game content. Not until after you beat the game, after you beat the post-game, and officially have nothing left to do. If the purpose of this game existing in the first place was to test the wireless adapter technology which came bundled with the game and increased the retail price to $40 compared to Ruby and Sapphire's $35, you would barely get to use it at all because of how asinine the trading restrictions are. Normally I would say a game making you work for something isn't necessarily a bad thing. In some games it's a really good thing, and I've stood by it in the past because I felt that mechanics that required effort of the player to unlock access to certain Pokemon were building toward a playstyle that was enhanced by them, one that favored minor co-op elements and persistent effort to get Pokemon deliberately placed in the late game. But in this case, locking trading until after the post game actively works against the very things this game is trying to accomplish. The majority of development time for these things was spent in making the wireless adapters, wireless club room, and wireless features like trading work. And yet, the way these restrictions are implemented makes it nearly impossible to even use the adapter at all. And to give you a more concrete example of why this is an enormous problem even if you're not trying to finish the decks in Ruby and Sapphire, let me walk you through a real situation that I ran into while I was replaying playing this year for this review, Hitmonlee. 
So since I am a veteran player, I decided I wanted to complete the regional decks while I was earning my badges just to make the game more interesting for myself and give myself more to do, if I had to sit through Kanto again anyway. Completing the regional decks is at any point something most serious players will want to do, so I don't think that this is an unreasonable goal I've invented for myself. There's also a star you can unlock on the trainer card for completing the regional decks, so the game explicitly encourages you to do this. I have a copy of Fire Red, and I have a copy of Leaf Green, so I thought I might as well trade myself some of the exclusives, right? I had completed Fire Red already and unlocked the daycare, so rather than trading away my only Hitmonlee, I thought I'd read another one. But even though this game has so many absurd restrictions on regional decks only for uncompleted copies, because I had beaten the game and had access to breeding at all, what I got instead was a Tyrogue. So sh now I have a Pokemon that I went through the trouble of breeding and hatching just to trade, but I can't trade it with the exact same game just because I beat the game in one copy and not the other. Not unless I buy a bunch of vitamins and raise it up to level 20 to evolve it anyway, which is a lot of extra work and I had already put all of my decent Pokemon in Pokemon Box, so I didn't have any strong Pokemon to trade it up with using the Versus Seeker. So I would have had to log out my GameCube, connect my Game Boy Advance to Pokemon Box, transfer a usable team over, grind Tyrogue up until it evolved into Hitmonlee, and then trade it to Leaf Green. That would have taken literally all day just to trade over one Pokemon that is perfectly legal without giving up my only hit only from that copy, which is what I ended up doing. Even just trying to trade between Fire Red and Leaf Green with a single copy that hadn't completed the game yet, the trading restrictions make it a total nightmare. So they failed their first goal, which was to make it at all reasonable to even use the stupid thing that came bundled with this game like a parasitic amoeba. But what about their second goal, making a safe, familiar, bankable experience? Did the trading restrictions accomplish that? Well, no, they don't. So much had fundamentally changed about the mechanics the game that just by copy pasting the battle system from Ruby and Sapphire, the entire experience of the game changes. For example, Pokemon Tower in Lavender Town is completely different this time because all of the Ghastlies now have the Levitate ability. In the original games, Cubone is available in the tower to give you an advantage over a type you had so far not encountered, to help teach the player how to deal with ghost poison type Pokemon. They would do this a lot in the first games. The first time that you'd encounter an area filled with mostly one type of Pokemon, they'd offer you a Pokemon with type advantage in or near the area. So if you got stuck and looked around, or just really worked hard to catch each new Pokemon in each area as you went, you'd be rewarded with a solution to the problem. It's a nice way to subtly teach the player about type advantage. Pidgey is available right before Viridian Forest, Paris can be caught in Mount Moon, and so on. They did the same thing here in the original games with Cubone, but adding Levitate actually makes it so that catching a Cubone here to battle your way through the tower is no longer a viable strategy the way it was in the original, and you don't have a lot of other opportunities for type advantage against them up until this point in the game. In fact, Copping, another very common poison type Pokemon, also now has Levitate, meaning that ground type moves are just not nearly as useful as they were in the original, and you have to balance your team differently. Bite is also now a dark type move, so you're much more likely to prioritize a Pokemon with Bite in this section instead. So if you have to play sections of the game completely differently from the original anyway, why make trading the exception? Another example of how the new mechanics totally change the flow of the game is Status. Status truly does slow the game down compared to the original. Many common Pokemon like the Nidoran lines have Poison Point, Pokemon like Paris have Effect Spore, and every electric type in Kanto has Static, meaning that most trainer battles end with a trip to the Pokemon Center to heal Poison or Paralysis. So either you you hoard items like never before, you prioritize Pokemon with abilities like Shed Skin, or you have to hike back to the nearest Pokemon Center all the time. And there are several areas in Kanto where that's just not feasible with how long these routes are that were clearly not designed with this mechanic in mind. It makes it difficult to even use the new Versus Seeker, because if you run to the Pokemon Center between Versus Seeker battles to help out your poison Pokemon, you lose the trainers that wanted to rebattle you. And even if you do adapt your strategy to take these abilities into account, you're not going to be getting an authentic original Kanto experience because you have to think about it differently and approach these new obstacles from a different perspective than you would have in the original games. Hell, Charmander learns Metal Claw now at level 13, which is super effective against Brock's Pokemon. One of the quintessential shared experiences of kids who played the original Gen 1 games is that anyone who picked Charmander would have to stop and painfully grind up to level 16 at the beginning of the game, or catch something else and level that up to even have a chance against the very first gym in the game. Making it easier for trainers who start with Charmander to beat Brock makes sense from a design and balance perspective, but it's a pretty big departure from what's authentically Gen 1. And if you're still not convinced, berries exist in this region, and respawning holes in the ground that you can check every 1,500 steps. But you can't plant or grow them, so what's the point? 
They exist to say something about managing natural resources in Ruby and Sapphire, but they're also just randomly here for the sake of having a new feature carry over. So obviously they don't really care about preserving the original experience that much. And if they did care about it, they obviously didn't think about it hard enough to make sure all these things still worked instead of just retconning them with new mechanics. So if these restrictions work against incentivizing players to actually use the wireless adapter, and they don't maintain the experience of the original games, the trading restrictions are clearly not about making sure you have the perfect original Kanto experience. They're about making you buy both $40 games and adapters because you can't trade with the games you already own. That's pretty much it. They're about ensuring more wireless adapters are in circulation and that more of the development costs for them are recouped. It's a pretty arbitrary decision that mostly just punishes returning players with a repetitive Kanto adventure that they have to slog through in order to get to the only feature in this game they actually care about. And it gets worse when you consider that a good chunk of the new content in the game that they went to the trouble of including it all is explicitly linked to the wireless adapter. Not only are there multiplayer features in the wireless room like making berry powder with friends, chatting and hanging out, there's also a wireless specific game corner on Island 2 that has two new wireless only mini games. And if you thought just owning two Game Boy Advance systems with both Fire and Leaf Green was enough to enjoy these, think again! Because these require three wireless adapters, three Game Boy Advance systems, and three copies of either Fire Red, Leaf Green, or Emerald all of which must be completed past badge 6. If that wasn't bad enough, two of the five stars that you can unlock on your trainer card are earned by completing these minigames enough times to get 200 of a specific action in each. So it's not just optional content if you're a completionist, the game considers it important enough to lock almost half of the completion achievements that exist behind completing. Imagine how much fun it would be to try to 100% complete this game by yourself. Being forced to play 400 rounds of multiplayer minigames on your own even if you somehow owned all of the hardware that you needed to do it. The sad thing is, these restrictions really mostly hurt the hardcore fans who would want to go to the trouble of experiencing all the content in the game and trying to complete the ever-expanding national decks, and who were the kind of people to spend a lot of time playing games by themselves in the first place. New players that don't care enough to finish the game or trade at all wouldn't even notice that it's so restricted. Many of the new features that were added were designed to make the game more accessible and palatable to newer players, smooth out the rough edges edges of the original games and deliver a more polished experience. For example, the L and R buttons now pull up a rudimentary help menu to explain some basic terms found in the game. I mean, I don't know who would have found this menu helpful, but they tried. Gold star for effort. The Tichi TV is a new major feature that basically exists as extra tutorial content just in case you need more help understanding certain mechanics. And at the very start of the game, there's an additional blurb shown that tells players to look for hints in the world as they get stuck. Now, aside from being pretty basic, I think that these are actually not bad additions. If the help that they're offering is mostly unobtrusive and encourages players to explore to find answers to their problems when they get stuck, that's actually a pretty good way to handle educating a new player base that might not be familiar with RPGs at all, how to play your game while still giving them room to learn as they go. So I don't even necessarily mind this, compared to some of their more obnoxious handholding that they'd force later on in the series. But I wish that they had made more of an effort, or any effort at all, offering the same amount of content that more of the returning players who had been with the series from the beginning would enjoy, if they were going to also lock access to the entire rest of the Pokedex behind 100% completing it. These decisions point to an attitude that takes for granted returning players, in an era where Pokemon was at its least popular, and many of us that stuck with it were facing extreme social pressure or ridicule for the decision to keep playing. At least where I grew up, it was a very lonely time to be a Pokemon fan. And with so many of these design decisions pointing towards prioritizing content for new players, it feels like the thinking was, Let's make the same game that we've already made to rope in the newbies that basically doesn't appeal to returning players at all, but let's still put something that they actually want at the very end of it so they have to finish it anyway. What are they gonna do, stop buying Pokemon games? And even if a lot of us were still kids at the time, we understood when we were not being rewarded for sticking with a franchise that was at best taking advantage of our loyalty and at worst actively trying to get rid of us. Combine all this with the fact that if you were a longtime player at this point, you really wouldn't want to play through Kanto again in the exact same way for the third time in a row. Remember, Kanto had been featured in every single game in the series up until this point except for Ruby and Sapphire. There really weren't a lot of other attractive things about this game than the possibility of getting more Pokemon back, since so much of it is unchanged from the original. And a lot of long-term fans were already feeling like they were being thrown by the wayside because of the original Dexit controversy. And maybe we were, they were trying to replace us after all. So it was just a slap in the face that on top of that we were still being milked for a few extra bucks by being offered a mediocre 
experience with restrictions on fixing the dex problem that may have just existed to sell more games in the first place. And Kanto is just not an interesting region to revisit with a limited dex. We had already been making teams out of the first 150 Pokemon for five years at this point, with few other games that even offered other regional dexes. The big complaint people have about Gold and Silver is that a lot of the new Johto Pokemon were in the post game, meaning we were still mostly using Kanto Pokemon even at that point. Being limited to just the Pokemon we had already used the most was very dull, and it made team building for the third Kanto game in a short amount of time difficult and not very fun. Since you can't even go to the trouble of trading yourself new Pokemon to make the experience more exciting, trading incentives are very low to begin with during the main story, which really undercuts their own damn adapter. Part 3.0. You cannot redo. Kanto isn't really designed to hold up to repeated adventures, and just doesn't have enough depth or world building to make me want to come back over and over, which is ironic considering that they won't let the damn place go even 20 years on. Kanto's main purpose was to introduce players to the premise of Pokemon, and use clever obstacles and NPC dialogue to teach them about the main mechanic set and complex RPG systems in place without just front-loading it all with a tutorial. After all, it was originally the very first introduction that we ever had to the Pokemon world, so they really didn't have a lot of room to explore the concept deeper than having most people in the region impart something practical about the ways you can use different party members or what the different stats do. It gave you room to figure out some things for yourself, but offered resources to learn these things passively through exploration too. These decisions made for a very good first Pokemon game setting, but they just don't have a lot of layers to unpack and explore by coming back. It's perfunctory. It's well designed for the adventure, offers very low cows and interesting non-linear progression that's refreshing compared to modern Pokemon games, and is fun to explore for the first time but you're not going to be blown off your feet by returning once you have the basics of the franchise down and are ready for deeper play, especially when you have to return to it immediately after spending a lot of time in Hoenn, a region with extensive theming and deeper messaging that gives returning players something to think about each time through. They try to use the fame checker to flesh out some characters, but it's really not much when they're pretty hollow to begin with. A majority of the characters in the fame checker boil down to a single line of dialogue explaining who they were in the original games, and here it's expanded to six, but the characters still do almost nothing other than stand completely still in one location the entire game. Of all the regions, Kanto is designed in the most video gamey way. It has traditional dungeons like caves, forests, boss dens, and towers. The map has kind of a circular design where all of the mid game happens in the periphery of Saffron, which you can see entrances to the entire game, but can't enter until you've solved the puzzle and are ready to have your final showdown in the big city with a big bad guy. It feels a lot like the way Dragon Quest games are designed really, and it definitely works well for what it sets out to do, but borrowing these well-known video game tropes from other RPGs makes Kanto feel a lot less like a real place that people can live in than Pokemon regions that came after it. It doesn't even really start to feel like it has its own identity until it has the chance to evolve and use the contrast of its change over time to make a statement in Generation 2. And after getting to see its potential paid off so well in those games, it's a bummer that here we're just seeing the unevolved Gen 1 version of it again, and all of its basic vanilla perfunctoriness. There are some things about Gen 1 Kanto that I do still love today, don't get me wrong, but when I want to revisit them, I'd almost always actually prefer to do it in red, blue, or yellow compared to any of their remakes. The things that are nice to come back to about Kanto are the ways in which it's refreshingly simple. You have a kind of freedom in what team members you use by how few stats there are to worry about, and how rock, paper, scissors the first iteration of the battle system was. Team Rocket is a very basic and by the numbers batting team that mostly stays out of your way and lets you have room to build your own story. But slapping modern mechanics on bogs down the charming simpleness of the original adventure. What would have taken me a day or two to complete in the original game is now a week-long slog drawn out by abilities and more complicated battles. And since maybe the thing that has aged the worst about Gen 3 is the pseudo-modern battle system with more of these variables that make Pokemon unique, but still before the physical special split that gave you the flexibility to make use of a wider variety of them, having it be the only innovation here is kind of a hindrance rather than a bonus. But wait, I know, I haven't talked about the Sevies yet. They went to the trouble of giving us the Sevies, right? That's all brand new content that they made just for Fire Red and Leaf Green, right? Well, let's think about what What's over there? There's a mountain with a legendary, a few towns, and the battle tower. If this sounds familiar to you, it's because that's also what's in the post-game of Diamond and Pearl. And Junichi Masuda confirmed on his blog that most of what they did in Fire Red and Leaf Green was in the name of pre-planning for Diamond and Pearl, killing two birds with one stone. Wireless connectivity in the post-game worked out ready to go, and you get a little bit of revenue early for your trouble. I mean, 
that's me being overly cynical maybe. There's not really anything wrong with them trying out ideas here for what they would do later in Diamond and Pearl. And it's not like the two areas are 100% identical, but it does just kind of feel like Fire and Lake Green were a guinea pig for bigger ideas for bigger games, rather than having a lot of their own identity. And although exploring the new environments is always fun, and it's certainly better than having nothing new at all, they feel underdeveloped compared to the rest of the game. Ironically, even though they were based off of real islands off the coast of real life Kanto, the Sevies don't feel like real places at all. The logic of how the world works is thrown out just to include them. You randomly can't surf between them when this isn't a problem anywhere else in the game. It feels like a contrivance in order to cut down on the work it would have taken to include them. It's also pretty jarring to go from the free roaming open feeling Kanto to these little claustrophobic linear areas, complete with teleport warps between them. Each of the islands is clearly designed to be traveled through in one direction, which makes them feel like staged video game areas just for the benefit of the player, not actual communities. The later islands are better about this with more branching pathways to explore, but they still have a logiclessness about them that makes them feel slapped together and not very thought through. Why would anyone live up here? How would anyone live up here? Why does her butler just appear out of nowhere? There's not even a door there. I think maybe they also originally weren't sure at which point in the game they're going to have you be able to visit all of the islands. After all, they are the red tape keeping you from being able to trade with Ruby and Sapphire. Maybe at first they weren't going to actually commit to making you finish the entire game in order to trade, but then later someone made the decision to artificially require you to own both Fire Red and Leaf Green to trade at all, so they compromised and let you visit just some of them after Blaine, but then didn't go through and remove all the cuttable trees that they threw in when it might have been and all explorable earlier on. That's the only thing I can think of that justifies all of these cuttable trees here. People were complaining that Victory Road and Ruby and Sapphire require too many HMs, but the Sevi Islands really require way too many for this late in the game. Opting to only go through once without running back to my PC all the time to withdraw an HM user, only two members of my party were usable for all of these trainers in these large areas with no Pokemon centers in between because I needed to lug every HM including cut around. The Sevies even introduced two new HMs in the post game, way past the point where they would be serving any purpose of actually impeding progress because you definitely have to have all of the badges at that point to even get them. I think maybe they wanted you to be limited in party members that you could use for all of these areas to make them harder for some reason, or they just weren't thinking at all and their map editors went absolutely nuts placing all this stuff. And the fact that this is yet more busy work standing in the way of me finally being able to complete the Pokedex in the games I actually like, Ruby and Sapphire, makes me not want to take my time and explore these areas because this entire game has felt like a chore. I never wanted to come back to Kanto, but I had to play all the way through it and all this extra stuff just to have more Pokemon in Hoenn, the place I actually wish I was this entire time. It's hard to look at these games for what they are today when obviously the disappointment that I felt when I first played them still lingers. Why yes, I am still butthurt about something that happened in 2004. Why do you ask? Maybe it's not totally fair to let that impact my assessment of these games 16 years on. But I also can't help but remember how much it stung to be one of the few Pokemon fans in 2004 that wasn't in their falling out with Pokemon phase. And then to have Game Freak turn around and release a game that so clearly took us for granted. These games did not sell well, and they heavily pushed local wireless multiplayer features in an era where you were least likely to know anyone or even have control over whether or not you could use them with another person. It felt like rubbing salt in the wound, a constant reminder that I was the only one I knew that still played Pokemon. And I didn't get to just opt out of it if I was a hardcore player who these games weren't designed to appeal to because they made them absolutely necessary for completing the Pokedex. And if you thought, wait, Tama, you could have just waited and played Coliseum and XD instead to complete the Pokedex. You would be wrong, because those motherfuckers forgot Slowpoke. But maybe even in the context of just where they fit into the series today, it's not such a great prognosis either. Maybe I would go easier on these games if it felt like they really tried to make great games and just faltered somewhere. It's possible for a game to be both a business move and well made. These things aren't mutually exclusive. But knowing what we do about their development, it's hard not to see them as unnecessary games that exist specifically to get in the way of my good time with the Gen 3 games I actually like. The decisions that they made to really necessitate paying more for more copies of the game and for no other discernible reason drag all of Gen 3 down. If you want to complete the Pokedex or even have half the Pokemon and Emerald in the Battle Frontier to work with, you absolutely have to 100% complete the post game in these games even if you don't like them or don't feel like going back to Kanto again at all. 
I dread trying to replay this generation every time I revisit Ruby, Sapphire, or Emerald, even though I love them so much, because it means I get to play one game that I really love, but then I have to charm my way through a bunch of games that have virtually no replay value just to complete any of them. Okay, it's not like these games do absolutely nothing to improve over the experience of Red, Blue, and Yellow. All of the things I could commend about the game are largely in areas of graphical enhancement and small details of polish here and there, like splash screens that you see when you enter new areas, or the largely improved tile sets and color palettes from Ruby and Sapphire. They took a while to find a balance where the graphics were bright enough to be seen on the Game Boy Advance without being as oversaturated as they were in Hoenn, and I appreciate that effort. They also put a surprising amount of time into the last time on your journey feature that Masuda insisted upon so much despite the programmers pushing back on it that it nearly tore the office apart. To aid players in remembering what they were up to and make their journey feel more like a unique story, there are even portraits of your Pokemon when you use items that are nice little touches to make your Pokemon feel real in and out of battle, and are nice role-playing features. Hell, being able to play as a girl in Kanto at all was something I'd been waiting for ever since the very beginning, but these things are very much style over substance, and it's hard to fully appreciate them when they are so at odds with the decisions that punish the player for caring about Pokemon enough to want to complete all of the content in the games. I don't think that it's inherently a bad thing to try and recoup R&D costs for Nintendo, or to aim the game at newer players, but I do wish that they had made more of an effort to keep longtime players in their thoughts while they did these things too, even if they inevitably had to replace their audience. Looking back, I can see that these decisions weren't personal, they were business, and maybe they benefited a lot of people. And I can see why people who might be interested in these games for other reasons might still like them. But there really is little reason why anyone in my position would enjoy them then or today. These things might be justified if the decisions that I so heavily disagree with were in the name of upping the challenge in some thoughtful way, or if the games had a message they were trying to impart that these mechanics and restrictions highlighted or helped serve in some way, but it doesn't have anything to say. There's a braille slab in the ruby room of Mount Ember that reads, everything has meaning, existence has meaning, being alive has meaning, have dreams, use power. And I racked my brain trying to figure out what, if anything in this game has meaning beyond being an excuse for Game Freak to make $80 at our expense. But I got nothing. <laughs>